All right. So thank you uh, for coming to the talk. Uh, I wish I could have get here in person, um, but just due to visa restrictions, I couldn't make it. Uh, but in any case, today I want to talk about the dexterous manipulation work in our lab. Um, so it, it is collect to 3D a lot. Um, so we have worked on this topic maybe for like three years now. Um, so there are basically a, a long story on how we developed and how, how we come across challenges uh, in this direction of work. Um, so essentially I will talk about all these things um, in the beginning as well. So um, we are going to solve this problem mainly using robot learning. Um, the idea is of using uh, robot learning for this kind of work is really, we try to leverage a lot of data. Wait one second, somehow my uh, sharing is not working. Just like, uh, okay, should work now. So yeah, so, so the learning from data and the data-driven learning or learning from large scale data has been um, showed like very successful in vision. Um, so we have now very beautiful kinds of um, segmentation results now. And then we also have, um, we also have like uh, chat GPT, uh, which allow us to write things much more easier. Um, and, and all this thanks to large scale data driven learning. So can we migrate this success to robotics as well? Um, there's a lot of recent efforts basically try to migrate these 2D pre-trained models uh, using self-supervised learning or text supervised learning um, and then transfer to the robotics task. For example, uh, people have tried to basically use um, like self-supervision, perform self-supervised learning on egocentric videos and then use this pre-trained model to, um, to transfer to the robotics task for performing grasping and um, um, pick and place task with this parallel gripper. So why this, this uh, success is very encouraging, um, a lot of tasks still relatively, is still relatively simple. And um, a lot of these tasks also does not have rich 3D um, interaction or context. Um, so what I'm actually, want to talk about today in here is something I feel like is missing a lot uh, in this robot learning community is to learn uh, manipulation skills that require um, 3D uh, geometry and context understanding. And particularly, um, I like a lot on these directions of um, learning dexterous manipulations or multi, uh, with multi-finger hands. So here are some examples of manipulation skills that requires a uh, very rich context and, and a geometry understanding in 3D space. So if you think about, if we really, really try to uh, rely on using pre-training using 2D lab works, it's actually very hard to use those backbones or representation and then apply on this task and find it is helping. So it's very hard to squeeze the 3D information out of those um, self-supervised pre-trained network. So we basically imagine if there's a um, smarter way to utilize the large scale videos. So the hope is that if we can uh, watch these um, human videos doing things, and then if we can, we are able to somehow extract useful 3D information out of these videos, then this inf information can be very helpful to teach how the robot should uh, operate objects in the world. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of researchers are also aiming at trying to uh, work on this direction and it makes perfect sense to do so. Um, so so uh, I think an ideal world, in the ideal world, we should be able to extract the 3D hand pose and 3D object poses and obtain the trajectories on how humans are doing things and then base, use this, basically use this to generate demonstrations and then do imitation learning. Okay, so all this sounds beautiful, but in reality, uh, when, when we try to work on this problem like three years ago, uh, we find that the 3D estimations of hands and objects are still far away from actually like, like usable for, for uh, obtaining demonstrations um, so that 
basically make us to uh, go back a little bit on uh, doing a work which now looks like a uh, basically looks like a computer vision work in the 90s. So essentially, we try to collect human demonstrations on doing things, but then just use um, like a green background. Um, so only with this green background, we are actually able to extract the 3D, uh, more accurate 3D hand pose and object pose, and then convert it um, to the third road, basically the object, um, the, the, ro the robots and object interaction demonstrations and use these demonstrations to help um, performing imitation learning for the robot to, to learn. So these here are basically some examples. We are trying to convert this human interacting with the object to, to robot hand interacting with the objects. Well, even though it is like a, like a green background thing, which is not very computer vision, still um, the post estimation is still very bad uh, in the sense that if you look closely, you can see the hands are shaking, the objects are shaking all the time. And then there's also penetrations between the object and hand. So in general, we find it really, really challenging to extract geometry from the videos um, for, for learning, uh, for generating demonstrations. Um, so because of that, uh, I kind of moved to, um, to try to go, go back to basically try to see if large scale learning can help solve this problem. Um, so a lot of work on post estimations in robotics community is actually focusing on the YCB objects data set. So in here, essentially, I would try to see if we can kind of um, get around uh, this, this thing, this problem. Is, uh, instead of solving these 20 objects in YCB data set, can we actually scale up the objects into much larger scale um, and then perform post estimation using this large scale data, uh, try to learn post using this data set uh, instead of just 20 objects. So we collect the data set, basically contains 1,700 objects and, and also use it to basically um, try to learn um, better and generalizable post estimation for 60 post estimation for the object. Um, so, so the idea is if we can scale up the data, maybe we can get better post and then maybe we can pass the human videos on the internet on the object uh, up, uh, estimate the object geometry instead of the, the green background video. Um, so here are some data uh, uh, we, we collected. Um, so it's essentially just use the iPhone and go around the objects and then we collect uh, basically object centric videos uh, used for training. Um, but still, uh, there's still a long way to go to from, from like, like uh, making this kind of object post estimation working. Uh, it's still a very, very challenging problem. Um, so it's still a very, very challenging computer vision problem. And then it takes a long time. Then uh, we continue to take a long time to, to make it work. Um, so up to this point, I think you can all agree with me that it's really, really hard to extract geometry from videos and then use it to, to help robots to do learning. So instead of uh, learning all this from videos, um, so in this talk, I'm trying to talk about one of uh, the other directions to get around this, basically is using teleoperation. So in this video, my student is basically doing some teleoperation inside the simulator. So we talk about this work. And then another thing that is very hard to infer from human videos is essentially the force. So by looking at the human interacting with the objects, if you just look at the pixels, I mean, it's almost impossible to guess how much force it is applied on the object. So how much force the, 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 uh, like, like, like between, is between the object and the human fingers, okay? Um, so how can we utilize this force information and help robot, robot to, to perform manipulation tasks? I will also introduce um, a work in this direction. So essentially we are trying to um, doing in hand manipulations and then um, using force sensor to do so. Okay, so that basically leads to uh, the two important topics that I want to talk about in this, uh, in this talk. Um, in general, uh, we, are, we are following the pipeline that use reinforcement learning and simple transfer. 
Um, I will first talk about how can we get more human demonstration data by using teleoperation and then do uh, and then do more general manipulation task using scene to real transfer. And then the second part, I will talk about um, the tactile sensing part. So how can we get four sensors work and then also perform this in, in hand manipulation and then in a simple real setting. So I will start from this um, teleoperation part. So essentially the goal is to ask humans to collect data in, uh, in simulators and then train an algorithm and then perform sim to transfer to, to basically do some tasks in the real world. Um, so we propose a, a very simple teleoperation system. It's a visual teleoperation system that requires uh, only a laptop and um, um, an iPad. Actually, right now it works with a laptop, only a laptop as well. So essentially, we are trying to make this device to collect data as simple as possible. So eventually, we hope that this approach can be scaled up um, to many mechanical turkers instead of just operating the lab. And we don't need any VR or AR devices, so, so uh, we don't need to buy the Apple Vision Pro to do this task. Um, so the whole pipeline is following basically, uh, we we try to use a visual teleoperation system to basically collect data first uh, inside the simulator. Um, once we have these demonstrations collected in the simulator, we can do retargeting to get um, the demonstration that is basically uh, useful for our target robot hand. And then we can perform um, uh, sim to transfer to get it working in the real world. So I talk about this step by step. Um, so essentially, uh, we have experiment with three tasks in this paper. And then what we do is really just try to get human pose estimations um, done in simulations and then convert this human pose to the robot hand pose and then um, operate objects using this robot hand inside the simulator. So let me give you some demonstrations how this work. Um, so essentially, uh, so the, user, the student is trying to first calibrate his hands inside the simulator. So you can have this hand uh, playing different fingers. So this is a calibration process. Uh, we have designed, we, we basically, is, we are very thoughtful. Um, so we have designed, we can have different size of hands, given different size of um, uh, uh, the operator's hands. Um, so we have different robot hands to, to make you feel comfortable, essentially. Um, so the, the human, the user in here, basically is trying to uh, operate the task, uh, opening the door. So on the bottom right, you can see him is basically operating things in the air but then he's actually controlling the robot hand inside the simulator to open the door. Um, so essentially we want to, uh, the, the idea is basically, although that there's still physical gap between sim and real, but the geometry interaction and the kinematics are actually uh, correct. And this already is becoming a very useful information for robot to learn. Um, so all these interactions, all these 3D ground truths can be obtained for free from the simulation. And if we can collect this kind of interactions, ground truths, then it can help um, doing imitation learning or reinforcement learning by, uh, by a large margin. Um, so once we collect um, these demonstrations, actually with the hand that is like customized uh, for each individual user, we can actually do retargeting to convert this hand to many different other robot hands depends on the downstream applications. Um, so essentially we can convert the, the customized hand, which is on top into different uh, uh, robot hands that is basically um, like on the, on the bottom, on the right is the elegant hand, in the middle is the shadow hand. Um, so you can be applied to different um, manipulators. So we just need to collect the demonstration once and then we can use in many different manipulators. So here is example on the top left corner, uh, we basically see that the uh, demonstrations collected by 
um, this um, this uh, this hand, and then on the the other three videos are basically retargeting results. Um, essentially, retargeting the the hand pose into different um, actual robot hand. Um, once we collect these demonstrations, we can basically add it into our reinforcement learning pipeline inside a simulator. I will not talk about too much into the pipeline. Uh, essentially, we applied an algorithm that is proposed like uh, in 2018 uh, with the demonstration augmented policy gradient approach, essentially combine the reinforcement learning term and the behavior cloning, cloning term using our demonstrations. Um, so I think uh, I, I like these experiments a lot, especially because it shows that learning from human can actually generate very robust policies um, in terms of the symptom real perspective. So let me show you this uh, result. So on the left is just pure reinforcement learning. On the right is actually doing imitation learning using the data we uh, collected. So we basically show that when you are learning from human demonstrations, you can get more robust graphs that is easier for symptom real transfer. So here is the task of flipping the cup and if you use reinforcement learning to learn this task, you basically obtained a policy that is um, trying to just um, just like like touch the surface of the cup and then flip the cup. But if you learn like what human do, you basically form uh, put the finger inside the the cup and then um, flip it. So I think this is a interesting observation for our, ourselves is that. Uh, learning from demonstrations not only just make learning faster and more accurate, it is also providing a more robust policy. Um, learning behave like behavior like human do actually allows much easier symptom real transfer at the same time. Um, so in this work, we have done demonstrate some um, some applications, uh, not just flipping a card, but uh, but also doing a lot of um, uh, grasping tasks. Um, so this is a work done maybe two, two, one, one or two years ago. Um, so so you can grasp a lot of different objects. We show some generalization ability of the policy by training on a lot of human demonstration data. Um, so this year, uh, this work is actually get extended um, as an internship project uh, in NVIDIA. Um, so we basically did a lot of software engineering work um, for this work that we extend this teleoperation system to, um, we call it any teleop. Um, essentially, we, we apply, it's not just for uh, a simulator. Uh, we actually make it work on different simulator, different hands, and also real robot as well. Um, so these are some the environments and simulations and, and real robots we have tried our system on. So the starting point is that we have a single system and then it works just the same interface, the same system worked on all the simulators and also the real robots and all the environment and different kinds of hands. So it's called any tele -op. Um, So here is a lot of demonstration basically showing that uh, the student, actually the same student, we just marked the face. Um, so so uh, it's playing uh, basically uh, the hand in the air, but in the simulator is actually uh, the hand is playing the piano there. Um, so this is the working in the Isaac gym. So this is the Isaac gym environment. We set, we put a piano in, inside the Isaac gym. And it also works in real. So essentially, this, this is a lot of students. You have a camera in the bottom, basically. And then you can um, just uh, do teleoperations on the real hands um, on, on, the, uh, on, the, on his left side. Um, so here is a lot of examples on opening the drawer. Um, so the same, again, it's the same system that allows us to collect data, not only in simulation, but also in build at the same time. Um, so it makes, um, uh, uh, it's a unified interface to do all these tasks. Um, so besides this like uh, contributions on, on this um, teleoperation system software side, uh, we have a lot of software perspective that I, I really like. It's basically a visualizer. Uh, it's, it's built on the MeshCat uh, from Rust Tangents Lab. Um, so if I give you this video, 
um, so so uh, maybe some maybe it's not looking very exciting, but it's actually looking very exciting for me. So essentially, this is actually disentangling the simulation and the visualizer. Um, on the left side, you're running your simulator on your server. On the right side, you're actually running your visualizer on your laptop. Um, so you can actually not necessarily install both things in the same computer, but you can run your simulation in in uh, in, in your web server uh, in your you know servers, uh, and then you can use your laptop to do all the visualization. Um, that actually how to do visualization uh, conveniently is actually a very uh, important things for robotics, but not really solved well. Um, so with this tool, we're actually able to um, to do something uh, that we basically can ask, uh, it allow us to ask mechanical turkers to start uh, collecting data using just a web browser. So I'm going to do a demonstration now. Hopefully it will work. Uh, if it doesn't, I, I mean, I, I'm at home. So the uh, the network connection is 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 better. So usually it work. I've done this talk in some um, some schools, and then there was always a Wi-Fi issues. So sometimes it doesn't work. So I hope this this um, I'm sharing uh, the whole desktop. I think, and then um, right. So let me. Uh, I already did the environment initialization, and. I copy this comment um, and then it's running. Okay, so I put my hands on in, in front of my uh, webcam in the laptop. Okay, so the arrow disappeared bec uh, because this initialization is done. Um, so now uh, if you can see my Zoom videos of me, I'm actually playing um, my fingers and then um, the robot fingers basically uh, following what I did. Okay, so essentially, if you can see it from another angle, um, that is basically um, trying to, um, so if I can try to just close my fingers, I can grasp things, and then I can put one, two, three, four, I can, four, I, for four, I actually to have uh, five, all five fingers um, um, basically opening up because it's like the retargeting is not getting my, uh, my small fingers. Um, so I can wave as well. Um, so so essentially, I think this is basically showing that um, the potentials of this kind of uh, pipeline that it actually allows a very easy and low cost way to help us to collect data. Um, so everyone can uh, hopefully oper operate, perform teleoperation by just opening a website using a webcam instead of doing um, complex devices. And this is also thanks to we are actually running the servers in AWS and then the visualize in local. Okay, so so that is basically this uh, tightly operation system. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. I will just keep playing these things maybe for one one more minute. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, um, I, I know it's hard to probably get Q8 in the, in. In, in the virtual um, talk, but then um, if you have any questions you want to ask, um, it, that now is the right time because I'm still um, playing my um, my robot in here. Um, yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, so I have one question. So how do you uh, handle like the absolute position of your palm and the relative position of your palm? Right, um, it's actually a very good question. Um, so the it is true that the 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 um, essentially we don't have a depth camera in here. Um, so we actually basically actually prepare a size to answer this question in case it happens. Um, yeah, is this one? Yeah. So so I basically it's just like um, we are basically as tip as uh oh it doesn't work. Okay, we cannot play. Um, yeah, so we are basically uh, estimating the relative scales of the hands in basically uh, based on just pixels. Uh, the closer one will be the larger hand, the farther away one will be the uh, the smaller hand. Uh, we are really just based on the how the scales of the pixel changes 
to this, this uh, to to kind of get a sense of far and close of the hand uh, to get the scale of the pen in this way. Um, so so yeah so and then use a little bit of camera intrinsics to do that. So in here, uh, it's purely based on pixels. There's no depth. Um, but if we happen to have uh, good depth sensors, it it would be much easier. I see. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so this is, uh, can be a very convenient, uh, 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 like, um, manipulator, um, for collecting data in the future. Uh, right now we are still working on a lot of, uh, things, uh, on like writing JavaScript or any other, well, uh, actually HTML codes for, um, to making it work much faster. Um, so it's not, it, it doesn't sound like much like a research problem, but I think actually still, um, in general, in robotics, data is really the big problem. We have collected 3D data, we have a lot of 2D images, but we don't have interaction data. So how to get as many interaction data as possible. Um, so that is the very, very important thing. And I think this is one way to go for it. Um, okay, so I, I will move on. To uh, so let me know if you have any question. You can also put on chat if there's this more. Um, so essentially, this is one way to collect a lot of data. And then we can train a reinforced learning once we collect the data. Uh, but then how do we do symptom real transfer? Uh, symptom real transfer is really, really a uh, hard problem. Actually, I think it, it is also one thing that stops a lot of robotics like work on simulator because a lot of times it doesn't transfer. Um, so uh, we, we, I just want to briefly talk about this work that we find that um, it's actually much, much easier to perform sim to real transfer when you are learning a policy uh, using point cloud input. Um, because a lot of times when you are trying to uh, train on simulation and transfer the real, if you just do your RGB um, image input or estimate state based on RGB, it has a very large domain gap. But if you use point cloud, you just build your policy based on geometry. So for example, in here, um, there's actually one is on simulation, one is on real. I asked a lot of people about which, which one is sim, which one is real. It's actually very hard to tell in, in a lot of cases. Um, so, so essentially in here, actually on the right is simulation, on the left is the real one. Um, so the sim to real gap is actually largely shortened um, by using this point cloud as input for policy learning. So what we're doing here is really just we train a reinforcement learning policy based on using, using point cloud input instead of just RGB or pixels or estimated object shapes that we stay as input. Um, and this policy can be trained on a lot of different objects and then you can generalize to a lot of objects in test time as well um, and, and unseen objects in, in real robot as well. We also have the uh, task on opening the door. Uh, essentially, we actually do some work crafting. Uh, we make the, the, the door ourselves. So we didn't make a lot of doors. So we basically changed the handles a little bit to show some generalization results. Um, so this kind of thing, uh, I just, this, this, uh, this method, I just want to mention a bit. So, um, so basically try to show that uh, learning reinforced, performing reinforcement learning on the geometry input uh, has actually a very large potential and also helps seem to real. Um, so, so yeah, and, and also helps generalization at the same time. Um, so these are actually all the vision parts. And then how about force? So can we um, model the force? Um, to like like uh, uh, and and use it in a generalizable way. So essentially, the touch sensor is really really something. It's really very hard to uh, use actually in general because um, I, I will talk about actually next. So essentially, in this in this uh, this paper, what we try to do is that uh, we try to perform in hand manipulation using touch sensor only without vision. Okay, so the task is basically you just, you, you just try to close your eye for one second and then 
um, pick up some object in your hand and feel about the object. You just try to rotate the object by feeling on it without actually seeing it. So that's what we try to do. So in here, we are trying to rely on the touch sensing to do it. Um, so the problem of touch has been started for many, many years in, uh, in robotics, and especially a lot of work, um, recent work on visual tactile sensor is based on gel sites on a digit sensor um, like this. Um, so one big problem I have for all this uh, sensor is that it's usually just applied on your fingertip, okay? So if for a parallel gripper, that's so much you can do just on the fingertip. And the digit sensor is also a fingertip. It's a very, very small scale. And then actually when you are applying on the hand, the hand is usually very, very large. And then when you try to use your hand, especially the micro hand to grasp the object, you will find that your fingertips a lot of times barely touch anything. So instead of uh, going for just like fingertip kind of touch, what really important is that um, is actually the whole, every place is on the hand. So our work is also kind of motivated by the glove uh, from Antonio's group, uh, not Antonio's group, but at the MIT group. And, and essentially, um, so what we're doing here is trying to attach the false sensor all over the electrical hand instead of just fingertip. Um, so on the left is the real, on the right is simulation. Um, so we can get a closer look at the hand. So essentially we are at attaching a very low cost FSR sensor, false sensing uh, sensor on top of the joint of the hand. Um, so this sensor is very, very cheap. It's twelve dollars per sensor in in the in Amazon. If you search now, you can find it. Um, so essentially, we try to uh, use this sensor instead of a very complex tactile sensor because uh, it's actually very hard to create a simulator for a complex tactile sensor. Uh, there's always a large sim to real gap. So instead of try to try to create a better and better touch simulator, what we try to do here is actually the opposite. Uh, we just try to apply as many sensors as possible, and then we binarize it. So essentially, we only have information receiving touch or not touch. Okay. So here is an example. On the left is basically um, you you touch the sensor you can get the continuous signals on how large the force you apply. On the right is binary, it's just touch or not touch. Is it, is it that if there's a touch, there's a pause. If there's not touch, there's no, nothing. Um, the idea is that getting touch or not touch actually largely minimize the domain gap between simulation and real. Um, so because in simulation, it's also very hard to, uh, very easy to get touch and not touch. You cannot model the details, how things uh, are touched, uh, what is the, the textures after touch, uh, like, like uh, show in the gel side, um, like when you, when you want to see in the simulator, but modeling whether it is touch and not touch is very, very simple. Um, even though this is just binary signals, but if you have a lot of them, it can actually capture um, a lot a large portion of the object state. So that's basically the idea. So we are trying to just use touch or not touch and then to perform uh, reinforcement learning in, all, again, Isaac Dream. Um, so this is trained with PPO. We just rotate objects in one direction. Uh, in here is Z direction. We also do the other X and Y direction. Um, so we train on di diverse objects, just doing this task. Uh, the policy is very, very simple. Uh, it's a PPO policy. It uh, takes the contact, touch or not touch, in each jump as input, and also the previous actions and the and the rotation axis as input. Um, so here is a zooming example. Um, so you can see the the little uh, pieces of touch sensor on the hand. If you turn green, it means that it touched something. If it is red, it doesn't touch anything. On the top right, we basically have seen some parts on. Uh, whether each sensor has touched something or not touched something, okay? Uh, and the training is really just, uh, we use a reinforcement learning 
um, and the reward is defined on how much uh, the object has been rotated, the angles. So larger the angle, you have uh, larger the reward, essentially. Um, so in our experiments on the top, we basically show that if you train with a single object, train and test on a single object, it doesn't really matter if you have the touch sensor or not. Okay, so the, the blue line is with touch sensor, the red line is without the touch sensor. Um, so you can just overfit to one object. It doesn't really matter uh, if you have touch sensor or not. But in the bottom, we basically show that once you try to train on multiple objects, adding the touch sensor, very simple touch sensor, binary touch sensors, a lot of them uh, can help a lot to, to get much, much better results. So this tells us that even though these binary sensors, a lot of them can actually capture, help capture the geometry of the object. To validate if this is actually correct, uh, we did a little thing. We didn't use it in, um, in training, but actually only use it for, for evaluation. So what we try to do in here is that we just rotate the objects in one circle, okay? Once we have this change this policy, we just rotate the objects for one circle. And then we collect the touch sensing information. We collect a sequence of touch sensing information as input for a neural network. And then this neural network can do 3D reconstruction of the object shape. And we basically actually can see quite reasonable object reconstruction results um, by just touching the object. So this essentially showed that um, actually just using this touch information, we can still get very, very um, um, uh, uh, enough and, and information to understand, understand the shape of the object. Um, so we perform sim to real transfer uh, along uh, a lot of object that is not seen in training time. Uh, we also have these demos on basically, we try to rotate object in the dark. Uh, we didn't make a lot of these videos because uh, in, our, in our floor, we need to do it. We need to shut down the lights for the whole floor. So many labs cannot work if we do this demo. Uh, so we just do it once, but essentially, uh, you get the idea that um, you can just touch it without seeing it and do the things. Um, there's some comparisons, of course. Um, so on the left, most left side is open loop. It means that you just use the same motion all the time, whether you can successfully uh, rotate the block. It turns out you cannot. Or in the middle, you can use a closed loop policy, but without the touch sensor. So you still know your, your, the state of your fingers all the time, but you don't have the touch information. Um, so it works, uh, the object is easily fall down in this way. Um, so we applied um, apply this approach in many objects as well. Um, so the most difficult one I showed in the beginning is the duck. Um, so we are actually able to still rotate the duck even though it's without, um, um, without having seen it in, in training time. Um, so we can also operate in, on soft objects. So we are showing basically uh, this tomato is from, from Whole Food. It's not, uh, it's not a fake tomato. Um, so we basically show that it, it doesn't squeeze the tomato and still rotate it pretty well. Um, so there's uh, objects from uh, the other, there's also other directions. So this is Y axis, and then there's the X axis. Um, so, so basically, um, uh oh, um, yeah, so, so rotating in different directions, not just one directions um, on diverse objects as well. Okay, finally, there's one demonstration basically showing that we can um, just rotate one single object, but, uh, but just input different commands and then uh, try to rotate the same policy taking different commands and then you can rotate it in different directions. Um, so that's basically all. Um, so, so um, yeah, so these are basically the two main things I want to uh, introduce today. Um, so essentially um, two ways to learn generalizable dexterous manipulation skills. One is towards um, scaling the data collection. The other is how to scale 
the force sensing, uh, use, utilize simulation, and then very, very simple touch sensor, but a lot of them. Um, so so that's, that's basically all. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, all right, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, we have any questions? Oh, you have one question here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I have two questions. So the first regarding the teleoperation. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I like the idea like uh, it's a low cost and you can uh, do a demo like uh, in real time on your laptop. Right. But, uh, I was thinking, uh, what, what, what do you think about using uh, using haptic glove? Because it seems like a more elegant solution to me. Right, uh, of course. Uh, Better device is always better, uh, but essentially the idea is to try to scale up. Um, so we are actually working on like how like getting Amazon mechanical turkers to help us to collect data. Um, so you be need to scale up that way. Um, it, it's very hard to send a haptic glove to everyone. So right. so essentially, yeah. So I think it works with a few haptic gloves and and um, that makes sense. But then. Um, essentially, if we really, really try to scale up the demonstration in, in, in like image less scale, um, so, so we need to have some way that like they have very cheap device and still working. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So my second question is about your tactile project. So I think right. there are like core, two core characteristics of the hand. So one is you binaryize the signal. And second one is, right. uh, uh, the, the, the resolution of the sensor is one, basically it's super low. So I was thinking like my question would be, um, cause I haven't read through the paper, but have you evaluated uh, like the gain from binarization and like how, how does uh, binarization contribute to a uh, simple transfer? And also like, uh, what do you think if we have a higher resolution texel based sensor, for example, the, the st standard in the st uh, standard setup of uh, Libro, you, you have Zella sensor, which has a higher resolution. Would, would that harm the sim to real transfer? Um, yeah, I think it really depends on how the tactile works. Um, so yeah, our, our work we did show that uh, comparing uh, continuous signals and binary signals. Um, so uh, continuous signals still works, but then definitely using binary signal helps. Um, so, so that we have a comparison there. Uh, it's just that even with such just this uh, one single point of touch, still there's a large simple gaps on how false it sends. Uh, definitely, we we would like to uh, explore more delicate sensors. Uh, it's in general just like the maybe the sensor you have just mentioned is also quite expensive. Um, no, I'm not sure whether you are mentioning the one I'm imagining, but it's like 50k. Um, to buy the set of them. Um, so it's actually quite expensive. Um, I think it's possible that you can do sim to real, but in general, it's just a more high resolution sensor usually just like we need to um, like larger sim to real gaps. And then we need to do more work um, between simulation and real. So actually I, the, I would in general prefer to make the hardware as simple as possible, and then try to use learning to fill up the gap. Um, and uh, just use learning to imagine what should we do um, instead of like designing more and more complex hardware. So so I, I probably would go for that more uh, instead of buying more and more expensive sensors. Thank you. Yeah. 